Um, so I'll call it an order of the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of uh, June 21st, uh, 2023. Today we have a couple agenda items. We have a palliative care assessment in Vermont that will be provided to us um, by two physicians. And then we'll have uh, the Medicare only budget guidance and then the staff presentation on the One Care Vermont budget guidance. And there's a potential vote notice for the Medicare only guidance. Um, so I'll turn it to our executive director, uh, Ms. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Chair Foster. And I have a few scheduling announcements and a couple of uh, public comment announcements. So first, this evening, we will be um, we will have our primary care advisory group, also known as the PCAG, that um, will be taking place from five to seven via Teams, also a um, physical location at our offices in Montpelier. And also next Monday on June 26th is our general advisory committee meeting, and that's taking place from 2 to 3.30, also via Teams with a physical location at uh, our uh, GMCB offices. All of the information on these meetings can be found on our website. If you go under committees of the board tab, you will find any of those. And if you can't, just reach out to me or Kristen and we can get those for you. Um, a couple of public comment periods. We will be, in fact, we already opened up a public comment period for the One Care Vermont FY24 budget and certification guidance, which you'll hear more about today. And Michelle will share more of those details on how you can public comment. And we have the ongoing public comment period on a next potential all payer model with our partners at C the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Any of those comments we share with the Agency of Human Services as they are leading the negotiations and the implementation of the model. Um, and Chair Foster, I, um, when Dr. Hepler and Dr. Wright start, I can give a little bit of background of our work with them um, I can do that now, but I think you might need to go back to minutes. So um, whichever you prefer. Yeah, why don't I do the minutes really uh, quickly? Great. We have two sets of minutes because I missed them last week. Um, the first minutes are from May 31st. If, anyone's, if everyone's had a chance to review those um, and there's a motion, we can take it up. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Is there any board discussion of the minutes from May 31st? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The minutes are unanimously approved. And then we also have the minutes from uh, last week, uh, June 14th. Uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. And any board discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the minutes from June 14th are unanimously approved. Um, so, Ms. Barrett, I'll turn it back to you to introduce our speakers and our first topic today. Great. Thank you, Chair Foster. So as a bit of background, and um, Drs. Hepler and Wright will get into the background on their program that they participate in, which is called the Leadership in Preventive Medicine Residency at the Dartmouth Institute. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board has been hosting uh, these LPMR, as we refer to them, doctors for the last, uh, gosh, five or six years. Um, other state agencies have also hosted LPMRs for their government and public health experience um, requirement as part of their program. And we at the board have uh, always found the experience working with these professionals really helpful and a learning experience on both sides of the coin here. So um, I will turn it over to them, but I just wanted to thank them for their great work. And I, I'm really eager to um, hear this presentation. And also a shout out to uh, Dr. Merman too, as, who's helped us a, a bit um, to prepare, helped the, the doctors prepare a bit for today's presentation. So thank you, Chair Foster. And I can turn it over to Drs. Wright and Hepler. 
Thanks very much. Can everyone hear me? You're a little bit quiet. Maybe turn it up a little bit. Better. Mm -hmm. Great. So thank you again, and thanks everyone for your time today. Myself and my co-resident, Dr. Amanda Hepler, are going to tell you a little bit more about a project we've been working on with respect to palliative care in Vermont. We know that healthcare sustainability has been a focus for you all, and we thought that taking a closer look at the state of palliative care would be a fruitful endeavor, particularly given that palliative care was not included on the wait time study conducted a few years ago. So before we dive into a discussion surrounding palliative medicine, we wanted to take a few minutes to introduce ourselves and provide you with additional background information about us. My name is Heather Wright, and I'm about to complete a fourth year in training in Hemonc at Dartmouth Health. Before this, I completed medical school in Maine and then matched in internal medicine at UVM. I completed my IM training in 2018, and I stayed on for a chief year after that. Like many other chief programs in internal medicine, I had a joint appointment as a hospitalist. And after completing this chief year in 2019, I started hematology oncology fellowship at Dartmouth, where I opted into an extra year through the leadership preventative medicine program. And with my training to date, I have really developed a keen interest for early integrated and easily accessible palliative care for patients who are facing an advanced cancer diagnosis. And my name is Amanda Hepler. Um, I went to medical school at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and did my residency in family medicine in Lake Trobe, Pennsylvania. I worked for 11 years in family medicine in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Then I spent one year as an associate hospice medical director with Beata Hospice. I completed a fellowship in hospice and palliative medicine prior to joining LPMR, and my goal is to help make palliative care more accessible to rural populations. So you've heard that myself and Amanda are co-residents in the Leadership Preventative Medicine Program, or LPM as we like to call it. It's a program that exists in Dartmouth in conjunction with an established GME residency or fellowship program, meaning that it's not a freestanding residency. We're enrolled in LPM concurrently with our home program. For me, it's Hemonc, and for Amanda, it's palliative care. It typically adds an extra year to our training, and during this time, we receive leadership training as well as an MPH through the Dartmouth Institute. We are required to work on a quality improvement project as well as a governmental health project, hence our work with the support of the Green Mountain Care Board to assess access to palliative care within the state of Vermont. After we finish the program, we are board eligible not only for our home specialty, but also for preventative medicine. So while practicing family medicine in Vermont, it had come to my attention that despite having an older population, Vermont tends to have below average hospice utilization rates. The 2020 edition of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization Facts and Figures included the following information for 2018. It showed that 42.9% of Medicare decedents were enrolled in hospice at the time of death, which can be compared to 47.5% in New Hampshire. The good news is that this was a 22% increase since 2014, but they were still well below the state or the, sorry, the United States average of 50.7%. Um, Vermont at that point had ranked 46th in hospice utilization, and despite the fact that there are um, many patient benefits to earlier hospice utilization. So you may be asking yourselves, why are we asking about access to palliative care? There is some literature to suggest that palliative care access can increase hospice utilization. And while there has been good uptake of palliative care in academic centers and urban areas, that is not the case in rural areas across the country. Furthermore, it is the standard of care for patients with cancer and it can reduce costs at end of life. Lastly, the Green Mountain Care Board did a wait time study using data gathered from 2017 to 2019 that measured how long it takes patients to be seen by a specialist but palliative care was not included in that study. So this seemed like there was a gap that this project could fill. Really the purpose of this project was to understand palliative care availability and services with no intent to criticize systems already in place. Our goal was not only to gather information across the state about access to palliative care, but also to share this information in ways that we can learn from each other, ideally leading to more patient-centered care and potentially cost savings. This appealed to the Green Mountain Care Board because you all are continually working on hospital sustainability throughout the state. And we think that you all see better access to palliative care as potentially playing a role in that work. 
So for a little more background on palliative medicine, it is still a relatively new specialty and is often misunderstood. Uh, in 2006, it was recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialties, but it was not until 2014 that fellowship became required for board certification. The NIH describes it as specialized medical care for people living with a serious illness and that it is meant to enhance a person's current care by focusing on quality of life for them and their family. So we work to improve quality of life through both symptom management and providing support with coping and ideally would work as an interdisciplinary team to provide goal concordant care. And goal concordant care is defined as care that honors a patient's values and wishes. And we use a structured goals of care conversation to better understand what that means to each individual. And it is also important to realize that it is not the same thing as hospice. Um, so there are not the same requirements for um, life expectancy or that the patient is no longer wanting to pursue curative treatments. So primary care providers, hospitalists, and specialty providers are already doing a lot of palliative care through managing symptoms and having discussions with patients. But the reality is that they often do not have enough time to have the goals of care conversations, um, which can sometimes take more than what they're already allotted for an appointment that is meant to discuss multiple things. Other times they may have the conversation, but it doesn't go as expected and they're not entirely sure what to do next. So in specialty palliative care, we are trained to help with refractory and complex symptoms such as pain, nausea, constipation, or shortness of breath. Again, that interdisciplinary team is really important in helping to manage some of the psychosocial and spiritual distress that patients have. Uh, so having chaplains and social workers and nurses involved, we can approach it from multiple different angles. We also help a lot with complex decision making. Um, so those patients who are stuck in that unfortunate position of not really having a good choice um, on all of the decisions that they have are maybe hard and aren't exactly what they hoped for. We again, try to understand their goals to help them figure out what the best route is for them as an individual. And we also lead family meetings because we've probably all seen patients who have multiple family members who all have a very different idea as to how the patient's care should go. And we help kind of not only advocate for the patient, but try to help get everyone on the same page. Because even after that patient has died, some of those family members may need to live for a long time. And how things happen during that really sensitive time period can affect them for a long period of time. So they can struggle with depression or anxiety or sometimes what we refer to as complicated bereavement. So some of the patient benefits from palliative care, one is there was a study in 2010 um, in patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer that showed that early access to palliative care allowed some patients to live longer. So the patients in the study lived on average 12 months as opposed to nine months for those who did not have the access to palliative care. Not only that, but they had a better quality of life. So they felt that their symptoms were well managed and their mood was better than the control group. And they reported just a better overall experience. There are also studies that show that patients who receive palliative care are more likely to receive goal concordant care and that their families are more likely to perceive that their loved one had a higher quality of care. So early on in this project, we were given an opportunity to join a regular meeting of the Vermont CMOs. We shared this information about palliative care with them, along with an explanation of the project and how we intended to use the information. After this meeting, we sent surveys to all 14 hospitals, as well as to DHMC in Lebanon and to the VA in White River Junction. The survey included aspects such as the number of full-time equivalent providers or FTEs, inpatient and outpatient options, wait and travel times for patients, as well as telehealth options. We also inquired as to the barriers for patients and providers alike. The specific questions we posed are listed here on this slide. From the initial request we sent, we received four responses. After we let some time lapse, we resent the surveys again with just a few additional responses coming back. Eventually, we ended up reaching out specifically to palliative care contacts within the hospitals that had not responded. And we were happy that we took this approach as we found that the responses we received from palliative care providers specifically were quite robust, particularly with respect to the open-ended questions surrounding barriers and needs. 
This is an infographic we created to represent the hospitals by size who did and did not respond to our survey. As a reminder, we sent the survey to the 14 Vermont hospitals in addition to sending it to the VA in White River as well as to DHMC. In total, we received responses from nine of the 14 Vermont hospitals and from the VA and DH. The majority of the smaller hospitals are generally critical access hospitals, which may have rehab beds in addition to the 25 inpatient beds. Two hospitals reported that they do not have palliative medicine as a subspecialty. Two hospitals reported that they have inpatient only. One hospital reported only outpatient home visits with respect to, in, to palliative care. And four hospitals re reported that they have both inpatient and outpatient services. And of the five that did not respond, four of these did not have any mention of palliative care on their websites. So the first item we looked at with respect to the responses is wait time. We split this into two categories, inpatient and outpatient wait times. We found that inpatients, as expected, were seen quite quickly. The majority are seen within 24 to 48 hours. Outpatient visits were a bit more variable, with three institutions reporting one to two week wait times and one institution reporting a two to three week wait time. The next item we looked at was telehealth utilization. We felt that this was an important measure given the rurality of our state. Three institutions reported fairly high utilization at 40 to 70 percent, with one institution reporting virtually no telehealth at less than 10 percent. With respect to travel time, this was highly variable and ranged between 10 to 120 minutes, with most falling in the 20 to 45 minute range. Lastly, we looked at the number of full-time equivalents in palliative medicine, which we will discuss in more detail on the slides to come, but essentially we found that the median was two FTEs with a reported range of one to nine, and one hospital reported one per diem provider. So then this did raise the question as to how much access is actually enough. So the Center for Advancing Palliative Care is an organization which has educational resources to better understand palliative care and resources to help hospitals improve their access to palliative care. They review each state and they gave Vermont a perfect score. Um, so I was worried for a minute that we were on the wrong track, but when we looked at it more closely, they were only looking at hospitals with more than 50 beds. And at that time, six of these hospitals claimed to offer palliative care and there were only six total. Um, but looking into it a little bit further, the Center for Advancing Palliative Care is asking about any access to palliative care. So if they have a social worker or a nurse or a care manager who is either offering serious illness conversations or even providing any level of palliative care, then the hospital is felt to meet the the requirement of having some sort of palliative care access. So they weren't specifically asking about board certified palliative care providers. So then found an article on understanding the current supply and projected demands of palliative care. The authors of the article looked at the number of palliative care providers per 100,000 people age 65 and over, working under the assumption that it's primarily older individuals who need access to palliative care. So the national average in 2018 when the study occurred was 13 providers per 100,000 persons over the age of 65, which they suggested was too low to meet demand at that time and was likely to become more of a problem as the baby boomers aged. Looking specifically at Vermont, in 2022, the population age 65 and over was roughly 133,000 people. And based on the data that we collected, Vermont had 22 palliative care providers, which would put them at 16.5 providers per 100,000 persons over 65, which looks good at first, but then we realized that in rural states like Vermont, palliative care providers tend to work only part-time in palliative care. So the hospital that they work for may only be able to give them a part-time position in palliative, and they're working the rest of the time either in family medicine or internal medicine or possibly some other specialty. So when we're really looking at the FTEs, um, there are only 9.9 .9 providers per 100,000 persons over the age of 65 in the state of Vermont. And not only that, there are some areas that do not have any specialty palliative care providers. So in this slide and the next, we're going to take a closer look at the population density in the state of Vermont with respect to both provider time as measured by FTEs and the age of the population. So to start, we looked at population related to access. Here we have a map that roughly shows the population density in Vermont counties with darker colors representing a higher population density. Pictured on the right, 
<clears throat> is a map with hospital service areas, which we have shaded in green. This represents responses received that indicate this service area has access to palliative care. Area shaded in red, we know does not have access to palliative care, and those in yellow remain unknown as we did not receive survey responses. To note, 26% of Vermonters live in Chittenden County, which has the best access to palliative care among the state's hospitals, with 4.22 FTE worth of providers working in that county. The counties with over 60,000 people include Washington and Rutland counties. Washington County has the second highest number of palliative providers, but only has access to inpatient palliative services, while access to palliative care re remains unknown for Rutland County, as well as for Franklin, Wyndham, and Windsor counties. On the slide, we'll show you how age and access to palliative care matches up. Here's a map showing the percentage of people in each county that are over the age of 65. In the state of Vermont, 20.6% of people are over age 65, and this is as compared to 16.8 in the U.S. as a whole. Across the state, those age 65 in each county is variable, and it ranges from 16.2 in Chittenden County to 27.1% in Essex County. So ideally, <clears throat> the oldest counties would have the best access to palliative care. But when we look again at the hospital service areas, the only county with more than 23% of the population over 65, we're confident that has good access to palliative care is Bennington County. The reality is that the best access, i.e. the green hospital service areas on the right, tends to coincide with the counties where less than 23% of the population is over 65. So our next step was to do sort of a qualitative analysis of some of the results that we had we were able to receive. So we included some open-ended questions in the survey to give respondents an opportunity to describe barriers to implementing or expanding palliative care at their hospital, as well as resources that they would need to make that possible. We also conducted interviews with Di Dr. Diana Barnard, who is a palliative care physician at Porter Hospital, who was recently in the news um, as the physician for a patient from Connecticut who had sued the state over the residency requirement to be able to access medical aid in dying. We also interviewed Cindy Bruzzesi, who is the director and ethicist for the Vermont Ethics Network, which provides education about palliative care and oversees the state registry of advanced directives. Another interview was with Carrie Wolfman, who is the CMO for One Care Vermont. And we also met with the primary care advisory group who helps advise the Green Mountain Care Board on issues that are specific to primary care. We used a program called Deduce to analyze this information and it was able to generate this word cloud, which shows some of the key ideas that surfaced during these conversations. Some of the things you will see multiple times, such as staff and funding, because it um, was repeated in multiple formats. So as far as the perceived barriers to implementing or expanding palliative care, the two biggest concerns that were raised were education and staff. And I think staff is not surprising because staffing has been an issue sort of all over healthcare in recent years. As far as education, we were able to break that down a little further into who um, the respondents were saying needed that education. So 40% said patients need more education, stating that the biggest barrier is patient education and the patient not understanding the value of palliative care, how it differs from hospice, and prioritizing one more appointment. 40% said that providers actually need more education, and it was Cindy Brzezzi who said that provider awareness in general isn't great. They often think it is the same thing as hospice and therefore are underutilizing palliative care. And 20% of respondents said that both patients and providers need more education. Other issues that were raised were the distance that some patients need to travel to actually see a palliative care provider, that it's difficult to have enough home support and socioeconomic support for patients, and the stigma that's, um, that comes along with palliative care in that people sort of automatically, again, link it to hospice. Um, but that possibly having palliative care earlier in a disease process and outside of an urgent situation would make the conversation less scary. When we asked what resources hospitals need, it was not surprising that staff was the primary thing that they mentioned. Um, and Diana Barnard actually kind of gave a little bit more detail than most other respondents in saying that there is not enough outpatient palliative care. And it's partly due to the lack of infrastructure for symptom management. So if there's only one or a couple of providers in an area, it is challenging to provide call coverage for a panel of patients. And then there is the need for support staff.
So when we met with the primary care advisory group, one of the things that we were hoping to learn from them is what they see as barriers to having serious illness conversations. So it kind of goes back to that slide that was shown earlier about the importance of primary palliative care being what most patients can access, especially since specialty palliative care isn't available everywhere. So I was actually surprised to see that miscommunication was the thing that was mentioned the most. Uh, and one specific example of this was someone who had a patient with ovarian cancer who understood where things were at, but the provider felt like she could not get through to the patient's husband. But after meeting with palliative care, he finally got it. I expected more people to mention time um, because when you have only 15 or 20 minutes for an appointment, it's hard to get through everything that you need to do, let alone to have one of these conversations that can easily take 30 minutes or more. Um, and I actually, during the, the conversation, did bring up my personal experience with difficulties with prognostication because when you have um, patients that you've known for a long time and have developed a relationship with, it can become very difficult to admit to yourself or to the patient that they are getting closer to the end of their life. One of the other um, participants also did mention that when patients are seeing specialists, that that specialist is focused on the next line of treatment and they don't come back to their medical home until there are no other options available or they're close to the very end of their life. So the question posed here is how palliative care can be helpful. And as you can see, most agree that palliative care is helpful with respect to support with complex issues. Some selected quotes to see are to the right of the slide. On top, Dr. Merman is quoted as saying, everyone leaves the conversation feeling good about what happened, even if it was a difficult situation. Another quote we pulled from the PCAG meeting is on the bottom. Dr. Maloney was able to help my patients stay out of the ED when nothing else worked. In some of the individual interviews that we had, we were able to um, harvest some improvement suggestions, uh, which we felt were very helpful and wanted to include for all of you today. Uh, one of the things that came up was that the need to expand into skilled nursing facilities and home health options. Um, there is some frustration over the fact that home health services are usually only covered when a patient is homebound, but a patient doesn't need to be homebound to be on hospice. So it doesn't really make sense that something that often precedes hospice care has a different requirement. They also noticed that there needs to be improved communication among providers and that many providers would benefit from specific training to have serious illness conversations. Dr. Barnard also brought up that regardless of what you do, crisis palliative care will always be needed, but there is an important need to work upstream. And the best way to do that is with outpatient palliative care services to begin having these conversations before things reach that crisis level. Cindy Bruzzesi also made some great points about legislation and that Vermont has an aging population. Um, so this may need to be something that is addressed with, with legislation, but may not be resolved only at the state level. And I thought Diana Barnard had this great quote in saying that systems see the value of palliative care, but they don't have a good plan in place to set aside the money to make it possible. So I hope you all can see that our initial approach to this project, including collecting survey responses, and then this really evolved into a community assessment of stakeholders with respect to palliative care, and it included interviews with both individuals and groups. Like many other issues, access to palliative care is complicated, and not everyone will agree on the best approach to expand access to such. We found that it is clearly helpful to hear opinions from various specialists and to understand the breadth and depth of the issue to help formulate ideas for change that are most likely to produce beneficial results and unintended harms. Seen on this slide are two differing opinions on the subject, and we think it really highlights the problem in finding a single solution. So before we conclude the presentation, we wanted to take a few minutes to highlight what we learned. Though we feel strongly that educating the public and providers alike on the benefits of palliative medicine needs to be done thoughtfully so as to avoid creating a demand that outstrips what our healthcare system can provide. At some point, despite staffing struggles, the health system needs to take a leap of faith and invest in palliative care, making it a priority and trust that this will lend itself to improved care and outcomes for patients. <clears throat> 
Furthermore, we think that the same argument can be made to policymakers and legislators. And we think that there are several opportunities for health systems to be creative with respect to palliative medicine and home-based care, but cost continues to be both a barrier and a challenge. Lastly, we found that one of the biggest barriers to increasing comfort to involving specialty palliative care is that many primary care providers want to be able to do this themselves. So some potential next steps that we see, one would be to continue conversations with One Care Vermont to encourage including palliative care measures in their next strategic plan to improve understanding of how palliative care services can enhance the quality of patient care in serious illness. To continue to work with members of the Vermont legislature to develop policies that will support expansion of palliative care in rural areas of Vermont and possibly policy to cover home health palliative visits for patients that are not homebound. We hope to create opportunities to provide education about specialty palliative care and ongoing opportunities to improve serious illness conversation skills to support primary palliative care and develop education for the public so that it is available when the time is appropriate. And to end, I just added uh, a brief comic from an article that um, was on one of the earlier slides about how palliative care is the umbrella, not the rain, and how early palliative care gives people the resources to have on hand for when they need it instead of waiting until, again, they've reached that crisis situation. So we just wanna thank you all for your time and we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you both very much. Um, I have a couple of quick ones and then I'll turn to the other board members. Um, you said that palliative care in Vermont has increased, I think is 22% since 2014. Do you have any sense of, you know, to what that could be attributed to? That was actually hospice that increased. The oh, hospice, hospice utilization increased 22%. I see. Do you know if palliative care in Vermont has increased in the last several years? That I am not sure, sorry. In terms of Vermont being below national averages, do you attribute that to rurality, access, awareness, or anything else? As far as hospice utilization, rurality probably does play a role. Um, in people that are in rural areas, it's harder for them to get um, hospice visits at times. I feel like, having worked in Vermont, that um, Vermonters are somewhat stoic and not necessarily wanting to access all help that's available. Um, and that there is some stigma that goes along with hospice care in I, it, my personal practice, I've actually had patients say that they did not want to be placed on hospice because they were just going to give them medications and kill them. And so I feel like more education needs to occur about the fact that hospice isn't there to kill you, it's there to support you through the end of your life whenever that may be. Um, and I think earlier conversations, again, can kind of help to change the way people are looking at hospice care so that they don't have that fear that everyone's just sort of giving up on them at that point, and also helping improve communication skills among primary care providers so that it's easier for them to kind of clarify some of those concerns for patients. You just described my family, which is why I was asking the question, because I know they don't access this kind of care because they're stoic and <laughs> don't want to get care. <laughs> so I was wondering yeah, if that sort of, yeah, that sort of cultural uh, issue is part of it as well. Um, okay, I don't have anything else. If any other board members have questions, go ahead. Hey, hey, this is Dave. I just want to, I turned my video off because I've got a funny connection today, but I just really want to say uh, I really enjoyed working with both Heather and Amanda on this project with Susan. Um, many rich, rich conversations. Uh, I learned a lot from both of them and learned a lot about Vermont and what we have for resources. So thank you so much for, for the hard work and for the, um, for all the conversations around it. And I just want to say thank you to you too, Dr. Merman, because it was nice to hear um, a physician in another specialty who has had good experiences with palliative care. Uh, I know I can be somewhat biased toward it or I would not have gone into palliative care. So, so it's good to have that balance and thank you.
Good afternoon, Amanda and Heather. This is Tom. Um, thanks for presenting to us. It was um, not only did you um, present well, the slides were beautiful. And I think that helps with impact and the information that you shared was very meaningful. Um, I just have two, two thoughts. I, I believe there was a study <clears throat> maybe more than a decade ago now, um, but I believe that folks who opt for hospice care actually live longer on average than similarly diagnosed patients. And I thought when that came out, that was a big surprise to those of us in any type of medical field. Um, and I thought I always thought that that should be um, pushed more, that more people should know about that, that um, because of the coordination of care that often goes along with palliative care and hospice, there seem to be some real benefits. It's not giving up, right? And, and so I think that that's a really important message. The other, the other thing that I just wanted to comment on, the, um, on a few slides you had um, a quote about it could be a potential disservice to educate patients because we may not have the supply. And I just, um, I've had some experience with that type of thing. In the late 1990s, we started, I was taking care of patients with chronic back pain and we started trying to find out um, how much what proportion of those patients were suffering from comorbid um, adjustment disorders, anxiety, depression, and how we could better utilize the psychologists we had on staff. And in our initial um, assessment of that, we found that it was way more prevalent than we thought, but it was underused. Over 20% of our patients had it, but less than 10% less than of those 20 were actually seeing the psychologist. And we started trying to design ways to improve the use of effective care, the psychologist. But when we did the math, it looked like the psychologist would just be overrun. There'd be so many patients who would, who would need this that it would just, it would burden the whole system. And there was a lot of fretting about that. And it never happened, right? The, the numbers looked ginormous, but it didn't occur, right? And subsequently, over the years since the late 1990s, I've done that type of work at dozens of places. And the numbers always look scary. And they never materialize to their fullest extent. And so the idea that we would not educate patients or that we would not start to make changes because it might blow up the system, um, I, just, I don't buy it anymore. And I'd encourage you to, to listen and nod, but don't stop doing what you're trying to do out of that fear. It just doesn't happen. That's great to hear, thank you, because I know that there is a lot of fear um, with the low number of palliative care providers that are out there that they will become overwhelmed, but yeah, I actually do agree that more education, if nothing else, if it does start to put a little bit of a stress on the system, it, it, it encourages more people to hire more palliative care providers and expand services, which is really what we actually need. Exactly. So thank you. That's good here. And I hire them before. I think that the first study you're referring to might be the one in metastatic lung cancer patients that had early access to palliative care. And you're right, the study showed that they lived about two and a half months longer, which is significant in someone that's facing a metastatic lung cancer diagnosis. And I think if we take a step back and we ask ourselves, if this was a pill, would it be approved and would we recommend it? And I think the answer to that is unequivocally yes. And to my knowledge, there's no studies that show any harm to palliative care. So I think it's a really important point that you make that, and this is how I explain it to patients too, they're unlikely to do you any harm they really can only stand to do good by you. And so I, I think that's a very valid point and something, a takeaway that we can take from this. Right. And the, the umbrella cartoon at the end was just so good. So like, that was so, so good. Nice job. Thank you so much. I'll just hop in here with a quick question. Um, really appreciate all your hard work um, in doing this work with the board and then presenting it to us. It's really helpful. I'm just wondering um, if there are any states, in, you know, did you encounter in your research any states that are doing really innovative, impactful work on the legislative front um, or in other 
vehicles to expand access to palliative care. Are there any states that we should model ourselves after or think about to explore what they're doing and how we might, you know, import that here? That isn't something that has been thoroughly explored by us yet. Um, there are some examples of states. I know that Kansas has recently passed some legislation to help support palliative care, but I'm not sure of the details of that. Um, and yeah, I think more states are starting to realize that it is something that needs some way of supporting it because palliative care sort of is one of those things that on the surface looks like it's losing money. So it's kind of like primary care in that it's difficult for us to actually bill enough to pay not only for ourselves, but those support services of chaplaincy, chaplaincy and social workers and nurses that really make the team um, the the good functioning team that it needs to be for patients. But when you take a step back and you look at reduced readmissions, shorter ICU stays, fewer ER visits, those sort of things that it typically is saving money for the hospital system. But it's really hard to measure those things that don't happen. So it, it's difficult case to make sometimes. Thank you. I just wanted to chime in and say thank you for your work. It was a very interesting presentation, and uh, I'm glad we could have you at a board meeting to talk about the, the information and maybe do a tiny bit of education ourselves here. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the healthcare advocate? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wright, Dr. Hepler. I hope I'm pronouncing your last names correctly. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the presentation um, and it, as a personal comment before I ask a brief question. Um, palliative care has been had an enormous impact on my own, not my own personal life, but my family's lives. So I appreciate you doing this work because I think it's an under understudied and misunderstood area of medicine, particularly um, just having older family members who've been a little bit reticent to receive the type of care for the misconceptions that you laid out. Um, so I want to thank you for for elevating that. Um, and the question I have is, there was a piece in the New York Times about a week ago about the use of AI, particularly chat GPT, and how helping physicians have difficult conversations with patients, which, I mean, I had a conflicted reaction to personally, but I'm curious if in your research and in your interviews with providers and um, the PCAG, this came up at all, or if people are using it. I'm um, just curious if you could talk a little bit more about that. I would say it's a brand new topic to us. We, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think ChatGPT was only created in March of this year. Is that right? I, th I think that's true. We just had a lecture on it as part of our LPM studies, and we talked about AI and how it's likely to change the face of healthcare and how we deliver care, but how do we mindfully, how do we mindfully do that? I would say it's, it's a little too new to understand how that will play a role, but I will be curious to see how that plays out. Thank you. I would also be very curious to see how that plays out. Because, yeah, I mean, I, I like to think that there are just these nuances and things that uh, you really need a human being to pick up on, but um, chat GPT, I think, can probably do some kind of scarily amazing things sometimes, but I, I I will need to look at that article because that sounds fascinating. Thank you. Back to you, Chair Costa. Um, we can take public comment. I see there's a hand raised. Uh, Mr. Ham Davis, how are you doing? Please go ahead. Um, Mr. Davis, is your hand up? Okay. Um, well, Sharon got one. How are you? You can go. Thanks. I thought that that was an excellent uh, presentation, very informative and clear. And um, I can see how it's confusing to understand the difference between hospice and palliative care because there's some overlap. But I was thinking as I was listening to the presentation, how kind of putting them together in the presentation added to the confusion and um, they um, the palliative care is not as 
I feel like helped um, in the confusion. And I can see how palliative care would be great with the uh, One Care organization in better access, uh, more affordable, coordinated care, and definitely would like to, to see you get in into One Care. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks for bringing up that point about that it did make it more confusing. Um, and yeah, and I actually have kind of clarifies the differences between hospice and palliative medicine. So I wish we had included that. So I apologize for the confusion. Doctor, I think I was confused a little bit, but it's mostly because I didn't get a whole lot of sleep the last couple of nights. So it wasn't you, it was entirely me. And I apologize because I, I mixed it up in my head, just not paying attention closely enough. So I'm sorry um, for that. Um, Mr. Davis, I see your hand is up. Are you, do you have a question or a comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I think the um, the whole issue of palliative care is a, a, a really a, a sort of a canary in the mine here for the uh, what I think is the real issue, which is not simply overall whether you need whether you need this kind of care or not. Uh, have you got it? How much of this and that? The question really is, it seems to me, is um, <clears throat> how are you going to how are you going to build it into your overall system? You've got four, who's going to pay, who pays these people if they're hospitals, okay? What you've got is 14 hospitals, but eight of them are primary care hospitals, which may not have anywhere near enough people to justify, uh, enough uh, patients to justify paying a full-time person to be a, to do palliative care. So the, that seems to me the real issue. The, uh, the, the question seems to be, um, you, what, what, it, where do you want the, who do you want to pay? Who does the system, who do the people that are sort of managing the overall Vermont system? Who do they want to pay these people? Is it hospitals? If it is hospitals, then at what level can a hospital afford a palliative care? I mean, if you get in, can you afford a, a palliative care specialist for just Newport, um, or, or, you know, or just Springfield? Or something like that, even need something bigger. So to simply say, well, we need it, and we've got so many overall. And we, the question, my question is, if you really want to do this, somebody has to suggest how you're going to manage it on a system basis. And I don't think I don't haven't seen any any of that. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, you're welcome, and thanks for raising your hand. Just just chair, um, just chair is I think my title, but thank you. Um, if you guys want to address that or respond, or you, please go ahead. But you don't. You don't have to. Up to you. If you have any thoughts. Sure. Well, I just the thoughts that I would have on that is that is actually a pretty common problem in Vermont. In that having full time palliative care providers isn't always an option, which is why at some host, some of the smaller hospitals that do have palliative care, only a portion of their time is dedicated to palliative care. So they may work three days in family medicine and two in palliative care or work in the ER a few shifts and some time in palliative care. So that helps ensure that not that much um, time is being allotted if it's not something that could be properly filled. Um, and also palliative care physicians actually do make less um, than primary care providers. Uh, so it's one of those few special times where you do fellowship and specialty training to make less money. So it's not hopefully overly expensive for most um, systems to hire palliative care providers, uh, but it does come back to that. How are you going to make sure you make good use of their time? And I think splitting the FTEs is a good way to, so the, the full-time equivalents is a good way to do that, hopefully. And if anyone has other thoughts, please feel free. That was, that was helpful, thank you. Um, uh, Sharon, please go ahead. I was just thinking, though, that I heard that there's cost savings in palliative care. So while it costs, there is greater savings on the back end. So it, I was thinking if it got more involved in one care, there would be cost savings. And I just heard, yes, shifting away from more expensive hospital-based care and ER visits and um, a, a, a lot more. I mean, coordinated care will always save money. So this is not an added expense. This is a reduction in expense. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon. And that is actually a very excellent point too that I should have included. Um, and most studies actually do show that 
um, palliative care does save the hospital system money, and in worst case scenarios, it does tend to be cost neutral, so evens itself out. Okay, it looks like um, there's no other public comment this time. So Dr. Hepler and Dr. Wright, thank you guys very much for your work with our with our team and for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us and for supporting this. It was a great experience. So I really want to thank again, Susan and Dave. It was fantastic to work with you. Great. Have a good day. Um, we'll turn to our next topic, which is the Medicare only budget guidance. And I'll turn to um, Health Policy Advisor Julia Bowles and our staff attorney, Russ McCracken. Great. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, I'm just going to get my screen share set up. Um, yeah, do folks see the slides? Look okay on your end. Great. Okay. Um, so we are back. Uh, to talk about the Medicare only ACO guidance, which we reviewed last Wednesday. Um, and as uh, was mentioned at the top of the meeting, we do have a potential vote scheduled um, at the end of this presentation. So in terms of the agenda for this presentation today, Russ and I are going to review some updates that have been made to the guidance since last week. Um, and then we will hand it back to uh, you, Chair Foster, to facilitate discussion, um, public comment, and then the potential vote. Um, and I guess I should also say, I didn't link to it on the slides this week, but the documents are linked on our website under the 2024 ACO materials. Um, great, so just diving right in, um, the first change that we wanted to highlight was the addition of two questions in section two. Um, these were mentioned, this, this content was mentioned in passing at the meeting last week, and um, I realized in reflecting on it that we didn't explicitly ask these questions, but that the this information was something the ACOs had historically given us in their presentation, so we just wanted to add the explicit questions um, to make sure we more consistently collect it. So specifically, the questions were, how many other states will the ACO operate in for 2024? and what percentage of the ACOs attributed lives for 2024 will be in Vermont. Um, and again, this is information we've historically had, um, but not asked as directly. So that is the first change. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Russ to walk us through the second change. Um, thank you, Julia. So this is following up on a discussion um, from last week and uh, what we've done here is we've um, separated, well, we've preserved question uh, seven that we talked about a little bit last week and then added a new question eight so that um, I think it's more clear what is being asked in these two questions. Um, the first one, question seven, which we discussed a little bit last week, what it is really targeted at asking an ACO if they do a, perfor a performance benchmarking against another data set or another peer group and what that other peer group would be. Um, and it asks for a few more details about how that's done and how the ACO uses it. Um, it's a question that we've had in the guidance uh, before, and so we're um, carrying that through. Um, the new question, uh, which is question eight, is um, calling out particular metrics I'm not going to use the word benchmarks here, but particular metrics um, that the Green Mountain Care Board anticipates may be included as reporting requirements in um, an ACO's budget approval. And um, I wanted to say just a couple of things about this. The, the first is that the board has authority under uh, its rule 5.501 to specify data and analysis regarding an ACO or ACO activities that an ACO must report uh, to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, second thing is to really make this requirement binding on the ACO, it, it um, will need to go into the budget orders as part of the budget approval. Um, the guidance tells the ACOs how to shape their submissions um, but to carry through conditions into 
uh, reporting and and um, you know modifying a budget uh, and any other condition that we have on the ACO for its FY24 performance here, it has to go into the budget. Uh, it has to go into the budget order. Uh, so the language that we have here for question eight is that the GMCB expects to require FY24 reporting of Vermont performance data for the uh, from the ACO as part of the FY24 budget approval. The reporting requirements will be finalized in the ACO's budget approval. The ACO should review the metrics listed on appendix tab D, performance data, and justify any proposed deletions or additions to these metrics. Uh, so Julia, if you could flip to the next slide. This is the list of metrics that's included in the guidance in tab D. Um, I won't read through them all, but you, um, they're part of the guidance and, and we can refer to them. Um, Julia, if you could flip to the next slide. Sorry, I went back once. Right. So the idea behind the question is that, as I said, the final metrics need to be uh, reviewed and approved either way um, as, by the board as part of setting the budget approval. By phrasing the question this way, we're trying to identify any concerns or areas of concern that um, we may not, that may be particular to an ACO um, or that we may not have, um, or that the board should rather consider in setting the final uh, reporting requirements. So, you know, we're soliciting comments from the ACO. It's also an opportunity for other um, stakeholders or uh, public or other agencies to review and comment on, on these metrics. Um, the metrics, you know, they're not the all-payer model agreement metrics. They're another set um, that I think it, it, my understanding is our metrics that an ACO should be familiar with. Um, you know, potential concerns, I we would let an ACO raise those, but we want to ensure that this isn't passing on any additional reporting burdens to providers. We want to make sure that it's something that an ACO could calculate just from the claims file that CMS provides to the ACO um, at the end of the performance year. Um, any concerns that want to be raised uh, around kind of alignment with uh, the all-payer model metrics and um, also allows uh, the board to kind of consider any particulars of an ACO, um, a Medicare-only ACO that uh, may result in, for example, any of these metrics having um, a sample size that's just too uh, too small for them to really report or track. Um, and I, I think we leave, by putting the question in the guidance this way, we're trying to solicit that kind of feedback to make sure it's um, issues are, or concerns have been raised before these metrics are set in the budget orders um, this fall. Um, so the next slide is uh, just some suggested motion language um, for the board to consider um, uh, following your um, review and, and discussion. And so with that, I'll turn it back to, uh, uh, to you, Chair Foster. Thank you both. Um, I'll open it up to board member questions or comments. Can jump in. Um, thank you, Julia and Russ. Um, uh, on the performance data, I'm wondering if we have any sense of how these metrics compare to the metrics required by the Medicare ACO programs, understanding that there are several, so that may not be a question that you're able to answer. Um, I, we have not, I haven't done a crosswalk to that exactly. There are, um, as you noted, we would I, I would expect ACOs in Vermont 
who are coming in under this budget review would be um, Medicare Shared Savings Program ACOs, but I, that's not certainly true. Um, so I, um, I don't have a specific answer. Totally understandable. I just thought I, I just wanted to ask to, to make sure we had an understanding of that. Um, so I, you know, I'm I'm of two minds. I like uh, the idea of performance metric on one hand. Um, on the other hand, these are Medicare only ACOs, where Medicare is the primary uh, designer and uh, and quite frankly regulator in some ways of these programs. And so it makes me a little uncomfortable to layer additional metrics. Um, without knowing how those compare. I do think, you know, the way the staff have framed the questions does give me more comfort because there's an opportunity in, in each budget decision to understand that. Um, the, and also to understand uh, how other stakeholders and particularly the Agency of Human Services would consider these metrics in lieu of it, when thinking about the current all pair model metrics and uh, sort of design, but also um, any future movement and future uh, performance and quality framework. Um, I think it's important that when we add reporting and metrics that we understand how those fit into the larger statewide efforts so that we aren't unintentionally working at cross purposes um, with them. Or you know, if we want to do that, we are intentionally working at cross purposes. I just want to understand it in relationship to those items. Um, so I'm still, you know, I'd be interested what other people think. Um, I'm sort of on the fence with this one, although I will say that the way the staff have framed the question um, allows for that information to come out in the budget process. So that makes me more comfortable. Oh, the only thing I'll chime in is the other alternative for me to get more comfortable would be to put the metrics out for public comment so that there was an option now, which I think would need to be more than just at the meeting since people will be seeing them for the first time today to get that understanding. So uh, those are all the thoughts swirling in my head. Any other board member questions or comments? Well, this is Tom, I have some. I'm also interested to hear um, other board members questions and comments. Um, but if you could, um, Russ or Julia, could you bring the measures back up, please? So I think this list is terrific um, and I, I'd like to explain why. Um, if we think about what an ACO is supposed to be able to do, it's to analyze data and provide insights from that data to help participating providers manage the care of patients in such a way that it reduces the costs of care for those patients. That's what generates the savings that the providers would then get a share of. That's why it's called shared savings. The way that an ACO would go about doing that is to look for patients who have an illness that could become very, very expensive and to manage that illness in a way that keeps it from getting very, very expensive. Those conditions are called ambulatory care sensitive conditions. If they're managed well, you should be able to walk into your doctor's office and walk out. If they're not managed well, you end up going to the emergency department because of a sudden need, unanticipated, or you end up admitted as a patient. So these measures look at admissions, emergency department um, admissions, in hospital admissions, um, and the ambulatory care sensitive conditions specifically. That managing those better should help reduce the total cost of care. ED visits should go down 
primary care visits should go up. There's nothing new or unusual about this set of data. They were designed to assess how well an ACO is doing. I think Robin has a great point. We should compare it to what Medicare wants to measure. I think we'll find almost a completely perfect overlap. These aren't new. It's not something different. They're the measures that should change when an ACO is working well. Measuring other things like well baby visits or preference sensitive care, those an ACO cannot change. Asking ACOs to measure those things and report on those is a waste of their time and resources. This is <laughs> a parsimonious list of the measures that should be changed by an ACO. It also includes, I, I believe there's a, a measure about mental health. We're interested in that in Vermont because we have such a crisis with our mental health system. But all the rest is just straightforward things that our ACO consultant has suggested high-performing ACOs monitor. So I'm not sure why there's such resistance to asking any ACO that comes into our state to monitor these measures. They'll help us improve the care of people in our state. So Tom, maybe you can answer for me. So for example, Medicare, and if you can't, no worries, of course, but Medicare has yes. an ACO pro program for those with ESRD specifically. So mm -hmm. I would certainly imagine that a subset of these measures might be relevant in that type of an ACO program, but probably not all of them. Yeah. And so what's beautiful about the way that the, the team wrote the question End stage renal disease, we'd really care about total care. We'd care about admissions. Those patients should not be admitted, right, unexpectedly. They shouldn't be going to the ED unexpectedly. They should be going to dialysis routinely. We shouldn't ask that ACO to tell us about diabetes long term complications. And they should be able to tell us straight up this does not pertain to our particular population. That's the way the staff is. Um, arrange the question. But the vast majority of these questions are perfectly relevant for end-stage renal disease. Sure. And all I'm suggesting is that we should be having that conversation before we include the list with the public and other members, other folks who are interested, before we put in the guidance, not after. That's all I'm suggesting. Sure. That makes great sense. Procedurally, I think that's great. No problems for me. Um, I observed some hands clapping kind of thing while you were speaking. I don't know where those came from. Me um, neither. That's <laughs> weird. Someone's more tech savvy um, than I am, but anyway. Um, uh, Jess or Dave, do you have any comments or questions? I'm happy to, I, you know, to chime in here. I support the proposed guidance. Um, I think we always have to strive to ensure that our regulatory review and the staff resources are somewhat proportional to the number of people impacted and the, our potential ability to take action, in particular in this case when it's a federal program overseen by CMS. But I think the guidance here achieves that proportionality, um, and I support it. So I'm a, a yes vote on this guidance. If I could jump back in for a second, please. You reminded me and of one I... thing, Jess. Okay. Um, sorry, Dave, I'll be done in just a second. The, the small number concern, um, I think we should not be leery of small numbers. The goal with um, preventable ED visits, for example, is not to have a statistically significant difference between one organization or another. It's to get it to zero. Right? So the small number problem isn't a concern. Each organization is trying to improve its number over time, wherever that number begins. And so we're not, we don't need a large enough N to get to statistical significance with the type of quality improvement work that you're trying to do with an ACO over time. 
Other types of analyses, we do need to worry about sample size. Safety, reliability, quality improvement, not so much. You know, that's great, Tom. I wasn't mentioning that with respect to statistical significance in data analytics. I'm more talking about, um, I think, you know, we have to recognize that a Medicare ACO, uh, Medicare only ACO is largely a federal program. And I'm just more thinking about the administrative resources associated with the board's oversight and our regulatory oversight in proportionality, you know, to the, to the number served. And so, like I said, I think this guidance achieves that balance and is appropriate, and um, I support it. So, but I'm I was not talking about statistical significance of data analytics in that case. I was talking about, you know, our staff resources and, and their ability, you know, to oversee all of these processes with multiple ACOs. Right now, we don't have many ACOs operating in the state, but that could expand. So, that was more my point. If that's not, if that makes sense to you. It does thanks. I'll try to go in with my camera on here. Um, yeah, I actually feel like I'm in agreement with all the comments because I don't feel that they're very counterfactual at all. Uh, I, I think this seems like a very reasonable list of metrics to um, have for evaluation. I agree with Jess's comments that I think we should be mindful of the regulatory, our regulatory requirements proportional to sort of the magnitude of an effect that we can have through regulation and, and the impact that that has and that that uh, uh, entity would have on Vermonters. Um, I I like the idea that Robin mentioned since this is a, a list that's coming out today, um, that there ideally would be time for some public comment and to cross-reference this carefully with the Medicare list to see if there's some um, obvious either additions or, or maybe a deletion, but I, I sort of would agree with Tom that I think this is a pretty reasonable list. So I guess that would put me in the camp of uh, preferring there be a period of public comment on this list of metrics prior to approving, but all things said, I intend to approve. The other way we potentially could proceed would be to um, approve the guidance uh, and come back and, you know, put the list out for public comment and then come back. So approve the guidance with the idea that there's a placeholder or, uh, you know, some language saying that Appendix D would get developed after public comment that would give us the mechanism to put it out for public comment uh, without there being a big rush. It would mean there'd be have to be some language tweaks to the guidance to reference that there would be so similar to in the hospital budget guidance we have language that says we will come forward with some data that we would expect folks to react to so we're approving a prospective inclusion of some additional information so we could potentially do it that way in order to vote today but still have time to do public comment on this for later inclusion understanding that um, you know, there's a little bit of time before the ACO submissions. I don't know, Russ and Julia, if you would be comfortable with that. Um, well, if it's okay, I, I can weigh in um, with a couple of thoughts. Um, when the ACO submits its budget, it's not going to submit metrics in response to this list. The, um, these metrics I, and are for the completed performance year. So they're um, and so there is um, Kind of our thought process in setting up the question uh, and having it in the guidance here was that there is this period of time between the guidance and the budget approvals um, where the board could get from ACOs, um, HS, any other stakeholder and 
um, even, you know, do a little bit more of our own work on sort of internally, you know, do, doing a check against the Medicare um, reporting requirements um, to the extent that's helpful um, before a final list gets approved by the board in connection with the um, um, the actual ACO budget uh, approvals and orders. Um, so that was kind of our the way we were thinking about one process. Um, it um, board member Lange, you're absolutely right that we do a little bit differently um, for some of the hospital budget metrics where we um, approve a guidance with a data set to come. Um, so that I think is a approach the board could take here as well. Um, either way, you know, I, uh, either way, the board would have to revisit and put this into the budget, um, the actual budget approvals for the ACOs, because um, the guidance won't carry through past past those who, who have to go into the budget orders. I think we should just put, open it up for public comment for a week and take it all up exactly as it is, depending on the outcome of the public comment and if it changes any board member's mind. Um, so why don't we do that, if that's okay with you, Russ and Julie? I think we're okay on time for that. And we have a hearing next week, is that right? Yeah, it looks like there's a head nod. Okay, so I'm fine with that unless, Julia or, or Russ, you have an objection to doing so. Okay, um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate. Chair Foster, that suggestion makes sense. We support it. Thanks. Okay. Great. And then um, turn to public comment. Um, but I will ask, you know, the I guess emojis that you're going, um, please refrain from using them. It's, it's kind of funny, I guess, in a way, but it's also rather distracting. And um, I don't think we need real time sort of uh, responses as we speak, so we can wait till public comment for those. Um, and with that, I'll turn it. Uh, Mr. Davis, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we got two comments here. I think that one of the one of the things that's true here in this whole issue is that you already have a ton of this information. If you look at the uh, reports by uh, AH uh, by Berkeley Research Group, Mathematica. Um, uh, four or five others at Dartmouth Research Group on October uh, 27th of 2021, they tell you things like how much of your inpatient, how much of your, um, how much of your inpatient, your uh, uh, utilization is coming out of your ER is, is, is wasted, is not justified. Those numbers run from anywhere from 21 to over 33%. Um, they have stuff like the LeapFrog Group, uh, uh, unnecessary surgeries um, and and so forth. The real question is uh, the real question is 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 what what you then do about it. You've got this. You've got a ton of this information sorry, that you have never never used or even talked about. The second thing I would say is I think it's an air of unreality here because if you look at this this laundry list, a huge list of well, do this and do that and do this and do that. I would. I don't know how much your familiarity is with small hospitals in Vermont, but they don't have the. They don't even come. They can't even come close to getting that kind of stuff. The only uh, new uh, uh, medical organizations that can handle that kind of complexity are UVM and Dartmouth. UVM can can be ordered to do that, um, and they should do that. Um, Dartmouth can do it also, but Dartmouth is outside of your reach. But but those are the two organizations that uh, that really understand um, exactly how it. Those are the only places in our system we have real deep understanding of how to run a full service hospital. And if you look at some place like your organization or um, or, or One Care, One Care has got one primary care doctor. And the idea that one one care doctor can just start start figuring out how to drive how to drive these 
uh, movements that would really substantially increase quality, okay, is really, really hard. I just don't believe it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, no, thank you for the comment very much. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so we'll have a special comment period for this. And um, why don't we take um, just a 10 minute break and then we can turn to the last agenda item, the staff presentation on the one care budget guidance. So we'll come back at 2.30. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, it's 2.30 and we can resume. And um, Ms. Sawyer and Mr. McCracken will present the one care uh, budget guidance. Thank you very much, Chair Foster. We are here today to talk about the fiscal year 2024 certified ACO budget guidance and the certification form review. Um, I would like to take a minute to thank the broader ACO team and the HCA uh, for their efforts in preparing the materials uh, for the basis of today's presentation. It really did take a village to get it to where it is today. So the agenda, first we'll cover background and the statutory authority of the board. Um, we will go into the certification eligibility form. We will walk through the budget guidance. Um, we'll talk through next steps and of course have time for public comment and questions. Um, and there is a timeline here. Um, this staff spent May and June um, working with stakeholders such as the ACO and the HCA um, getting um, the guidance and the certification form feedback. Um, and then today we are presenting on this. Next week, June 28th, there will be a potential vote on the budget guidance. And then we plan on publishing both the certification form and the budget guidance on June 30th. Um, there is a public comment period, um, Susan mentioned. It opened yesterday. Um, we welcome all public comments. You may do so by visiting gmcboard.vermont.gov and you'll see a button right in the middle of the screen um, that will lead you through the process. So um, the ACO budget review, um, all ACOs operating in Vermont are subject to a budget review. Um, there is a threshold of 10,000 lives, which defines the scope of that review. Um, and we create a guidance, so an annual, it's like an annual budget review manual um, that we give to the ACOs to help that guide the way that they submit their budget to the board. Um, we heard from Julia earlier about the Medicare-only ACO uh, guidance, and today we're really talking about the certified ACO budget guidance. The board also goes through the uh, ACO certification process. So ACOs that want to accept payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance must also be certified. Um, ACOs that plan to accept payments from Medicare only are not required to be certified. They just go through the budget process. Um, and for certification, the staff create um, an annual eligibility verification form. We call it colloquially the certification form. That particular document does not need a board vote, but we will review it today. And then the board's authority is outlined in those two, um, the statute there linked as well as rule five. This may be familiar. Um, we have presented on this before. This is just a visual outline um, that shows really that the guidance process overview, depending on the type of ACO that we are considering. So today, um, if you follow the boxes that are uh, highlighted in yellow, that's what we're talking about today. Whereas on the right was um, the Medicare only ACOs that Julia and Russ walked us through earlier. So the standards and requirements by which we review the ACO submissions are set forth in 18 VSA Chapter 220 um, and GMCV Rule num, uh, 5 and in the All-Payer ACO Model Agreement. Um, and I will also notice uh, note that the ACO does have the burden of justifying its budget to the board. So here's our approach for the fiscal year 24 oversight um, process. So the process started really with input from multiple internal and external parties. Um, I'll just note that OneCare as of this meeting had not provided feedback on the guidance this year, other than some minor technical um, edits. 
So the priorities, um, really the budget targets, as we will discuss, um, this section of the guidance has been fleshed out considerably this year. Um, we also prioritize the use of the benchmarking report and expect to see the ACO tying their budget to trends we see in this report. Um, the staff aims to complete a data-driven analysis to allow the board to make data-driven decisions. And of course, we um, look to standardize reports and templates with consistent metrics and definitions. The outcomes of these processes are the reporting manual, which was published at the end of March, and the FY24 budget guidance for Medicare only and the certified ACOs, as well as the certification eligibility verification form. Um, as a reminder, the reporting manual exists to outline the standard reports collected from OneCare during the performance year, year over year. Um, it includes things like the network development strategy, clinical focus areas, population health and quality improvement reporting, quarterly financial reporting, um, and then specific reporting on such things like the CPR program and how they're addressing adverse childhood events. Um, there's also a section for ad hoc or one-time reports uh, as might be requested by a budget order. Um, we aim to also make the budget submission to be about the forthcoming budget year rather than reflecting on the current performance year um, because that is really the role of the, um, the reporting manual. So here are some staff goals. A lot of the goals from 2023 were carried over into 2024. So I just wanted to outline the ones that we, we carried over. Um, we started off the process by crosswalking the guidance to rule five to ensure that we were covering all of our bases, that all of the requirements the board must take into consideration were covered by um, prompts um, or data collected within the guidance. Um, we do try to emphasize data whenever uh, over narrative explanations whenever possible and where appropriate. Um, we do consider the timing of information requests, um, such as like sometimes it's really possible for a piece of information to be included with the budget cycle, but depending on um, you know the way that the ACO updates certain reports um, or does planning, sometimes it's more appropriate to collect it at, at a different time during the year. Um, we're taking into consideration that actually both 23 and 24 are extension years of the APM agreement. Um, we always aim to remove areas identified as duplic duplicative um, and streamline questions. And we uh, incorporated last year for the first time um, performance benchmarks and prescriptive guidance as allowed. Um, and as I mentioned, we really fleshed that out this year. So for certification this year, we updated questions based on potential ACO changes. Um, I know that there were there was a special interest in data analytics, so we fleshed out some of the questions around that. Um, in the budget, we increased focus on performance benchmarks and that prescriptive guidance. Um, we're utilizing the benchmarking report as a source of data for budget analysis. Um, and also included in the budget guidance is um, an executive compensation analysis um, that is, is really new to the budget process. So let's look first at the certification eligibility form. So this is an overview of the certification process for ACOs. Um, as mentioned before, all ACOs that accept payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance must be certified once initially, and then once they are certified, an ACO must annually submit a form to the board to verify that they are continuing to meet the certification requirements to describe any material changes to any matters addressed in the certification sections of Rule 5, which are listed out here. So the 2024 certification materials have undergone changes with the intention of improving clarity and breadth of questions, while also reducing burden for both the ACO and staff. The materials are a set of narrative questions and a small Excel workbook that collects data regarding an ACO's policies and procedures. Um, so the material changes, and I'll just make a note, throughout this presentation, all of the text in bolded blue um, indicate changes from last year's guidance. So the first change was the removal of questions regarding the structure of executive compensation. 
And the logic behind that was that we were going to move this over to the budget process because there's a lot more flexibility um, in the in the statute and the way it's written out. Um, so it is not that we are not um, exploring this area. It is that we simply moved it from certification to the budget guidance. That being said, there are still certain requirements in the certification rule around executive compensation, and we will continue to ensure that OneCare is um, fulfilling those requirements through the certifying um, process. Um, we updated software-related questions to better align with the current state of the data analytics structure and to provide more detail in how the requirements of 5.210 are being met. Um, and we modified a question to uh, ensure compliance with 5.206C regarding One Care's process for monitoring the effectiveness of its population health management policies. Um, so when once published, the materials will be posted to the GMC website under the 2024 ACO budget and certification page, um, and they will be issued to One Care by July 1st. Um, and one care must return the materials um, to the board uh, on or before September 1st. And just another reminder, the board does not need to vote on the certification form updates. All right, let's get into the budget guidance. So I will just breeze through this slide. We've covered most of this. Um, just noting one care Vermont is currently the only certified ACO in Vermont. So this guidance really is has been created with one care in mind. All right, so themes for updates this year. Each section was reviewed for clarity, word count, key narrative, um, highlight of the updates, the submission and instructions. Um, we edited those to require formulas to be included within Excel files that were submitted. There were times where we would get information in um, or like uh, financial information uh, through an Excel document and not always know where those numbers were tying within other workbooks. So hopefully that will um, make analyses a little bit um, more straightforward for our staff. We did remove some of the COVID-19 related language and some of the narrative questions. Um, we targeted questions based on internal review and stakeholder feedback. Um, we focused on benchmarking report results, hospital primary care um, payments and executive compensation. Um, we improved upon the data collection templates and we placed more emphasis on uh, budget targets. So we moved um, the order of the guidance around so that the budget targets are the very first part um, of the actual document. After the instructions, these targets are, are um, front and center. Um, the, ob the objective of these, these targets is really to provide the ACO with the opportunity to develop their budget based upon um, the budget targets. So these are priorities that the board has made clear that they would like to see in this budget. Um, there's also in the section the all pay mo all payer model growth and financial targets are included. Um, and then we have um, a set of data uh, and sources that we use when looking at the submission for this um, for. Uh, this section, we reference the Medicare United States per capita fee for service projections. Um, we're looking at the March 23rd, uh, sorry, 2023 Medicare benchmarking report. We're looking at um, Medicare Advantage uh, United States per capita fee for service projections, and we reference the HCP LAN report as well. Um, as far as any implications for not meeting a budget target or missing a budget target. Um, there is no hard and set um, um, consequence of that. I would say that if the ACO is unable to meet a proposed budget target, that the, that would result in just a, a very thorough staff analysis. The ACO would have to justify why they were not able to meet, the, meet this uh, budget target and it would just undergo a thorough rigorous analysis um, at the staff level and, and we would of course bring that to the board. Um, and if a budget target is to be met, then that would result in um, a, a, you know, a still review, but lesser scrutiny um, on that particular measure. 
So here is one uh, budget target that was carried over for from fiscal year 23 with no or minor updates. So the first one is that the FY24 commercial benchmark um, trend rates must be consistent with the ACO attributed population and the Green Mountain Care Board approved uh, rate filings. So new proposed budget targets for fiscal year 24 are the remaining eight. Uh, the first is that the ACO shall use best efforts to meet or exceed the goals for reconciled and unreconciled FPP as adopted by the Green Mountain Care Board as seen below and identify and report specific obstacles to achieving the goals and action steps required by one care or others to overcome these obstacles. And the goals for um, the, the reconciled and unreconciled FPP for Medicare is 53%, Medicaid 55%, and commercial 24%. The third budget target is the ACO shall hold 100% of the Medicare uh, advanced shared savings dollars at risk at the entity level and not pass this risk along to the provider network. This budget target is a carryover from one of the budget orders from the um, fiscal year 23 budget where the ACO, the ACO was um, ordered to hold a portion of those shared savings dollars uh, as risk at the entity level. And this is um, that, that acted as like a, a glide path to holding the entirety of this um, of these dollars. The fourth ACO budget target is to increase risk corridors for all payer programs above fiscal year 23 levels. Um, uh, an increased corridor without, we didn't want to dictate the amount of that increase um, because that would, we want to allow for the network um, to increase the dollar number of dollars at risk and allow for flexibility and negotiation with payers and with the risk bearing entities. Um, number five, uh, the ratio of operating expenses to population health management or payment reform payments, which includes FPP, shall not exceed the five year average of 3.25%. Um, and then budget target number six uh, reflects a continuation of the trajectory that was set during the vote on June 14th last week regarding executive compensation. The ACO shall cap the total compensation in fiscal year 24 for the ACO's executives, vice president and above at the 50th percentile of the benchmark used by the ACO to establish its executives compensation. Number seven. Um, the ACO shall structure the variable proportion of executive compensation so that, that at least 40% is tied to one care's fiscal year 24 achievement of specific and measurable goals related to performance and cost and quality metrics. Quality metrics should align with any payer program quality priorities or ACO clinical focus areas as long as those priorities or focus areas are consistent with the all payer model quality framework. Um, this has been an area of interest for the board. Uh, the general consensus being that the goals that have been set by OneCare historically have been at the ACO operational level rather than at the ACO performance level, and that the board wishes to see at least a portion of, of um, variable compensation tied to goals that are more closely tied to the outcomes that affect Vermonters. Um, and we also want to see these goals align with the clinical priorities that the ACO already has in place um, so as to support the streamlining of efforts. Number eight, um, the ratio of population health management funding to the number of attributed lives must be at a minimum of the fiscal year 23 revised budget amount. Specific line items may vary based upon any in internal evaluation of the effectiveness of individual population health management programs. Um, OneCare has reported evaluations of some of their internal population health uh, programs. And while we want to see um, population health investments continue to be a priority for the ACO, we do want to allow for the flexibility should the outcomes of evaluation show that a shift in investments is warranted. And the final ACO budget target, um, this is regarding the March uh, 2023 Medicare benchmarking report, where one care ranks below the 10th percentile among the national ACO cohort or for metrics where the trend has shown a decrease in performance between the years of 2019 and 2021. 
choose three metrics that the ACO will address through the quality evaluation and improvement plan. The ACO should use metrics on which the ACO has the most influence on the outcomes and should justify their choice of said metrics. And then we'll go into part two. Again, this was previously part one. Um, there there have, hasn't been a change in the structure of this um, section other than just moving where it is in the guidance. So section one is an ACO budget executive summary. Um, the objective of section one is to provide brief narratives to summarize the components of the budget submission and describe the ACO's vision for the coming budget year, including a strategic plan update, the provider network, payer programs, attribution estimates, finances, network programs, and population health and uh, evaluation. There's no specific data or documents for this section because it is an executive summary. So the main change is that the section was revised to capture the shift from the last strategic plan to the new strategic plan um, that one care is putting in place for 24. Um, so question one, A, B, and C, um, they were added to capture changes made during the strategic plan um, that have been in development for 24 and reflections on the previous plan. G and H um, were added, we added language, uh, asking for summary of plans to integrate findings from um, evaluations and the benchmarking report into their budget and practice. Section two covers ACO provider contracts. The objective of this section is to describe ACO network development uh, strategies and any changes, changes to provider agreements and addenda for the budget year. We use appendices 2.1 and 2, which are the network provider lists. Um, and we also reference the provider agreements and addenda uh, that are uh, submitted for 2024. Um, th the main change here is that we asked for um, a, a description of any changes made to contracts, the provider contracts. Um, but in question one, um, we simply removed a table as we found that it was duplicative of another piece of information that we asked one care to provide. Um, question number two, um, we asked uh, the ACO to explain changes from the previous year and how each contract aligns uh, provider incentives with the ACO's mission. Question three, um, we went a little deeper asking to um, the ACO to explain rationale for any changes made to their network development strategy. Um, and then question four, we updated the table associated with this question to include provider type and ask how the ACO addressed any provider concerns. This question um, for context is around any changes to the provider network if there were um, provider practices that left the network, um, just collecting the reasons why they might have left, what kind of provider they were, any response, that sort of thing. Section three uh, looks at ACO payer contracts. The objective here is to describe the ACO's uh, expected or assumed payer arrangements used to construct the budget, assess payer arrangements uh, for qualifying as scale target initiatives. We use uh, Appendix 3, which is the scale target initiatives and program alignment forms, and um, we do reference the payer program agreements once they're executed for 2024. The main change here was that the section was updated with questions regarding changes in public payers and progress with commercial payers. Um, so question two, uh, we removed a summary table and we added questions regarding the effect of the Medicaid redeterminations, um, the impact of Medicare Advantage enrollment, and changes in the result combined. Five. Um, let's see. Pardon me. Um, question five. The question was added to inquire about the ACO's FX, uh, efforts to uh, ex excuse me execute risk bearing commercial payer contracts. Question six um, is a question requesting an update. Uh, 
on the FPP pilot with Diva, um, OneCare described this pilot in as part of their FY23 revised budget, um, and we're just asking for an update. So section four covers total cost of care, the objective being uh, describe the assumptions used to set trend rates and total cost of care targets by payer program and the drivers affecting settlement results of the prior year. Um, we look at appendix 4.1, which is the total cost of care performance by payer. Um, and we look at appendix 4.2, which is projected and budgeted trend rates by payer program. Um, so the main change here is that we did remove um, COVID language from a couple of questions. Um, question one, we updated Appendix 4.1 to include both a starting and, um, and average attribution by payer program. Um, so we could get a look into what they're expecting for, for change over the year in attribution. Question two, uh, we updated to include an explanation of growth rate by year compared to national growth rate by payer. And question four, the question was updated to assess how the ACO is aligning incentives to meet their growth targets. Section five covers ACO network uh, program and risk arrangement policies. The objective is to describe ACO program policies for provider payments and risk arrangements. Uh, describe the ACO risk model by payer and by risk bearing entity, any ACO held risk, and third party risk protection. The data sources used in this section are Appendix 5.1, which um, outlines the risk held by payer and by risk bearing entity, um, as well as Appendix 2, uh, 5.2 which covers the shared savings and loss by payer at the HSA level um, risk bearing entity. The main update is um, we are exploring provider payment strategies that may differ between hospital and non-hospital primary and specialty care practices. Um, we hadn't um, in previous iterations of this guidance gotten down to that level, but for question one, we wanted to see if there were differences um, in strategies between hospital and non-hospital practices as far as how providers are being paid. Um, question two, it, the question was expanded to capture the ACO's goals, strategies, opportunities, and limitations on monitoring and providing incentives for reducing potentially avoidable utilization. Question six, uh, we just reordered this question and we also uh, inquired about how efforts will improve uh, in, in fiscal year 24 for identifying high and low value care. Section six is the budget section. So the um, section objective to su uh, submit the ACO financial plan prepared according to the full, accountab uh, full, full accountability or the non-GAAP and the entity level or GAAP financial sheets. Um, these are submitted through the uh, adaptive database. Um, we also ask for them to submit additional financial data as specified, such as sources and uses, uh, population health management expense breakout, hospital specific information, um, FTEs by functional area within, in, within the ACO, as well as leadership um, management salaries. We ask the ACO to describe major variances in the financial plan from the prior year. We ask them to describe outsourced services uh, and fixed operational expenses and describe the basis for the variable executive compensation. So the main change, um, questions were added to assess specifically outsourced services, um, fixed operational expenses, and the executive compensation bonuses. So our sources of data here are the full accountability budget, the entity level budget, the variance analysis report, the FTE report, ACO management and compensation, um, as well as the form 990, which is generally available um, in the fall of each year. It doesn't always exactly line up with the, um, with the budget submission and as well as their financial audit. 
So here are some other templates used in this section. The um, as far as the adaptive templates, we did do some updates to um, the line items in collaboration with OneCare um, to ensure that appropriate items are captured. Um, we uh, added some columns in the source and uses template uh, to capture the UVM Health uh, Network self-funded payer program uh, and any hospital fixed payment offsets. We, for the hospital participation worksheet, we added a row for the um, UVM Health Network self-funded payer program as well. Um, as far as collecting information in uh, 6.7 for ACO management compensation, we asked for both the current year projected as well as what they were budgeting for the budget year. And as far as 6.8, population health management expense breakout, we added a row to capture the mental health screening and follow-up initiative in the case that is something that is being budgeted for in 2024. Um, and then also in the adapted da database, I apologize, these may have, oh, this is the questions, the narrative questions. We included the staffing sheet, um, which was not previously collected through adaptive um, sources and uses. Um, just for clarity, we requested definitions for each one of the funding sources. Um, and then question six. We added this question to explore ACO operational expenses that may be fixed versus variable. Um, we wanted to really get at um, what operational costs might be affected by increases and decreases in attribution or participation of payers um, versus fixed costs necessary to do uh, business. Um, as far as question eight goes, it's a data analytics transition question. Um, we're looking to assess the expected outcomes of the data analytics transition. We wanted to get at what is going to change at the network, at the provider, and at the patient level um, as a result of this transition. And then we also, for question 12, wanted to expand this question to capture discussion and use of any prior surpluses or losses. Section seven uh, captures population health information. The objective is to collect data and information on the ACO's approach to population health management and care delivery. Um, we receive the data in the form of four different appendices. Um, the ACO clinical focus areas simply compares the status of these areas um, from previous, previous years um, to the current year. Uh, the population health and payment reform um, appendices is, or appendix is a convenient way to capture basic information about all of the population health programs delivered by the ACO in one place. Um, appendix 7.3 provides information about care coordination efforts over the past few program years. And the final appendix uh, provides us with data regarding the amount paid out to different provider types for each program year with care coordination or, or more recently, the PHM program. The main update here was to reflect the new care coordination model. There has been a multi-year shift um, into what we currently know as the PHM, the population health management model, which incorporates other disparate programs, um, including the previous care coordination program. So the care coordination program doesn't really exist anymore. It's part of the PHM program. Um, so we had some updates we needed to make. Um, question one, we did remove a duplicative question um, that we covered in section five under risk methodology. Um, question three, we uh, asked for insight into um, how they use specific strategies um, to address root causes and improve results. Question four, um, th the question is, to, is regarding the ACO's methods for prioritizing their investments. Um, and we also updated Appendix 7.2 to include columns for major objectives and outcome measures and KPIs. This was the um, worksheet that collected kind of uh, all of the um, different population health programs all in one place. So we're looking to um, collect any KPIs, uh, measures, objectives that are being collected at the programmatic level. 
Um, question five is around care coordination. We updated the language to capture uh, assessment of implementation of the PHM program in 2023, any observed clinical outcomes, and any anticipated changes for 2024. Uh, we updated Appendix 7.3 to capture um, the percent of care coordinated population by payer uh, and care managed target for 2024. Question seven is a new question. Um, we asked for a description of how the ACO ensures that primary care earned incentive dollars are flowing to these providers and uh, or are being invested into primary transformation efforts. This may sound very familiar um, to our discussion that we had last week. Um, and then question eight was a new question exploring the consequences um, or expected consequences to care delivery resulting um, in the end of the public health emergency. There may be waivers that are being rolled back and how does the ACO anticipate that changing healthcare in Vermont? Section eight um, is around evaluation and performance benchmarking. The objective is to discuss evaluation of provider satisfaction with ACO participation and network programs um, and evaluation of the ACO quality improvement program, uh, discuss the use of key performance indicators and the implementation of the ACO performance benchmarking system. There is a new data source, Appendix 8.1, uh, and we also use, we reference the uh, Medicare benchmarking report as submitted in March. So the main change for this section is, um, is, is a continuation of efforts from last year. This section was new last year, um, and it was a really good starting point, but this year we've really expanded the breadth of questions about how the ACO is evaluating itself and the actions that it is taking as a result of these findings. Um, so question one is a new question and Appendix 8.1 is part of that. So we're looking um, to collect information about surveys conducted by the ACO and the response taken and the outcome of those responses. Um, and that looks back you know, over the life of the ACO. Um, and then question two gets at what questions um, the ACO intends to ask its network uh, in the future um, and any improvement in their surveying practices um, question four is around evaluation of their population health management programs. There are some new sub questions to this um, part. We asked about the evaluation outcomes of the CPR and the 2022 care coordination model, as OneCare has shared that they have been doing evaluations on both of those programs. Um, question six is a new question around the ROI analysis uh, that was described during OneCare's fiscal year 23 revised budget hearing. Question eight um, is a question that's tying back to budget target um, number five, which is the benchmarking, um, the benchmarking metrics. So it's the choosing three that the ACL will work on for the performance year. Um, and so we're just tying, we want some narrative to accompany um, the, the metrics they're choosing to justify and, and tying the metrics that they've chosen to the funding streams where they are basically putting money into those efforts. Question nine um, is around some causality around some of the, the metrics that were shown. Um, so there were, um, Identify, there were a few different metrics identified by OneCare during their hearing of their revised budget where they said we have not yet um, determined the causality of you know, why specialty care visits are low um, and why there's high spend in utilization, why length of stay is high. Um, and so I just wanted to follow up with them. We wanted to follow up with them and see if they had been able to dig into causality of those, those outcomes. So question 10 um, is, is you, we would like the ACO to identify specific metrics where they feel they have the most influence on the outcomes. Um, and for those where external factors play a role, how the ACO envisions progress being made in these areas. We're all well aware that um, healthcare reform is a very complex beast and it is not, um, it is very multifactorial. And so being able to parse out where um, 
different parties are able to really play a role and be effective in moving the needle on things is something we're trying to get at with this question, at least from the ACO's perspective. And fi the final section, section nine, um, covers other Vermont all-payer ACO model questions. The objective here um, is to describe strategies for assisting the state to achieve the goals in the Vermont all-payer model agreement. Um, describe the ACO's roles in achieving those goals and to identify opportunities for stakeholder collaboration to achieve these goals. There is um, an appendix related to this, just collecting information on the quality measures from the all-payer model. Um, and the main change here, it was very minor. We just um, removed some COVID-19 language. All right, so the last couple of sections, part three is really the revised budget. This just outlines the expectation that uh, the ACO will have to present um, a revised budget in the spring of 2024. Um, and the only change was to, you know, just a technical update to update it to um, align with the current uh, revised budget process. And then likewise with the monitoring, this just um, outlines the, you know, the expectation that there will be a reporting um, manual and that there is a current reporting manual that's been published, found at this link. Um, so just technical updates there as well. Just as a reminder, here's the outline of the timeline, um, just for reference, encourage any um, public comment through next Tuesday, uh, prior to the potential vote, which is scheduled for Wednesday. And I will turn it back to you, Chair Foster, for any discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I'll open up to the, my fellow board members for any questions or comments they may have. trying not to go first again so if somebody else would like to go that's great otherwise I do have a couple you're, you're welcome to go Robin go ahead okay thanks um so I had a couple of of questions um the first that is relating to the budget targets um so Michelle you did an excellent job explaining what happens if targets are met or not met I went back and looked and I didn't and I could have totally missed it, but I don't think that's actually spelled out in the guidance. And I think it might be helpful to spell out what happens if the targets are met or not met in the document itself, which is something that we did do in the hospital budget guidance. So that's just a suggestion for for you to think about. Um, no, no need to respond to that now because I'm bringing it on you. Um, so I did have a question about the FPP Medicare goal. Um, in the LPR model agreement, it is the state's responsibility to negotiate changes to the Medicare program, um, which quite frankly, the state has attempted to do in the past unsuccessfully. And so I'm a little curious why we would put a goal around Medicare when it's our response, our collective, not our necessarily Green Mountain Care Board, but the state's responsibility to do that negotiation and make those changes to increase the availability of FPP. So that yes. might be a rhetorical question. If you don't want to answer, that's fine. I just I think it's a little weird for us to put a target to improve that when we're the ones on the hook for it, we collectively the state. I can give um, I can give a brief explanation of where that target was pulled from, and that was a previous target set by the ACO itself. And so we are just in, a, in an attempt to hold some accountability to a target set. Where we are just encouraging, you know, the ACO to um, achieve a target they set, and if not possible, to explain any obstacles or barriers that might come between the ACO and their ability to achieve that. So that would give the ACO an opportunity to explain why they might not be hitting that target. And it very well may be um, the um, situation that you are explaining, Robin. Yeah, I think, I mean, my recollection is that, that the point of that, the board requested the ACO to set those targets at one point. And in that submission, 
that they made, it was essentially like, we would like to achieve this in Medicare, but state, it's your responsibility to do it. So I don't need to be told that again, personally. I mean, if others would like to do that, then I'm not going to die on my sword. I just, I, I think we know the reason why the target has not been met. Uh, and it just seems unnecessary to me to include it. So I'll just throw that out there. Um, Uh, thank you for um, including a question around uh, the impacts of the waivers being rolled back from the sunset of the PHE. I think that'll be interesting and helpful information to understand how some of those waivers will, you know, which made it much easier to coordinate care and do things even outside of the ACO. Um, how that will how that's impacting care delivery if at all and maybe you know there's been other ways to implement the care delivery changes without those waivers now with from medicare but um i think that'll be interesting to learn about and understand a little better um so hold on let me just check my list So um, the other questions I have are around, and I apologize, I didn't ask these last week, but I was not expecting the conversation last week. So how is how is the 50th percentile benchmark of the executive comp chosen? So currently, um, uh, the ACO through its its parent company, if you will, um, UVM Health Network, um, they set their executive compensation based on um, uh, in an internal policy. And the, in that policy, it is described that the base salary is um, approximated at the 50th percentile. There is some nuance there. Um, they set a, a range and the median of that range for that particular position is set at the 50th percentile. They reference, um, you know, national kind of compar uh, comparative groups that they that they look at, um, but they also make adjustments in salary depending on the region, um, and then they kind of give themselves some flexibility there. So. The 50th percentile is a little bit of a um, a simplification of this of the current model um, of the way that the ACO's executive compensation is currently set. Currently, that their base salary is at that 50th percentile, and then with the um, inclusion of variable pay. Uh, it is benchmarked again approximately at the 65th percentile. So, to s very much simplify it, you're essentially eliminating the variable pay. Um, however, there is nothing in this um, budget gu uh, budget guidance that says that there cannot be variable pay. They would just have to keep that variable pay within the 50th percentile. That you would not be able to go above that if that is helpful. Yes, thank you. And certainly I could see how like variable pay may vary year to year. Uh, with the 50th percentile benchmark, is that a policy that's used at hiring? Like when someone is I, first hired? So the um, there is a range, I would imagine it would depend um, on the individual and experience and all of that. Um, but the so the 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 pay range of a certain position varies from its median, which is the 50th percentile. There is 50% below and then 50% above at the high range. So I can't speak to how any individual um, being onboarded um, as as executive um, for the ACO where they would fall in that range. Sure. I'm, what I'm what trying to figure asking? out is, is it similar to the state where you're hired into a step in that range encompasses all of the steps that potentially you might accomplish or whether it is um, like basically the way that it's used to hire somebody into a specific salary and then increases over time would 
perhaps be set using a different benchmark or a different budgeted amount. I, I just don't know. So I was just trying to understand that sort of the I basics did, of how this works. Sure. I did not see that described in the policy we were provided, but it could be that that's included in another more generalized um, policy that we did not collect. Um, yeah. So it, it, it could be the case, but I did not see it described as such. Um, I would imagine that as um, national trends changed, the benchmark would then change. So the 50th percentile would change year to year. Sure. Um, so that salaries would, would move. OK. Um, and do we know how this impacts current employees? Um, the the budget target? Yes. Um, well, I, it is up to the board of managers at One Care to establish their budget. Um, and it is uh, up to them how they want to either, um, I don't want to use the word comply because they are not they are not required to comply with any of these budget targets, um, but they they can decide how they they want to try to fit that into their budget or not. Um, so I don't have a definitive answer. I'll also I just want to open it up to Russ too. I see he popped on screen and he might be able to help with some of these technical questions too. Thank you, Russ. Um, sure, I don't have an answer to that exact question offhand, but um, it's something we can. Uh, definitely circle back with uh, next week with a, a clearer response. Okay, great. Um, I think that is it for me for now. Um, but I'll double. I'll go off. Uh, I'll mute myself and look through my notes to make sure I didn't miss anything. So if someone else has questions, they could go. Any other board member questions or comments? I guess I'll um I'll pop in here then since we're on the, the topic of executive comp. Um first a huge thank you to the village, as you described, Michelle, for all the hard work on this um ACO guidance. It you know, having watched it over the years, it continues to evolve and improve every year. I think there's some great questions that have been added this year and improved data templates and uh, really, really thorough. So I'm really appreciative of all the hard work that you and Russ and the rest of the team and village did to, to get us where we are today. Um, I don't have any questions. I just have a request um, actually for our legal and our ACO oversight teams. Um, the proposed language capping executive total comp at the 50th percentile, it's a it's a fairly new regulatory approach that the board is taking. And I think if we decide to continue in that direction, we should do so with full information about the potential intended and unintended consequences of that sort of regulatory approach. I've always appreciated the board's focus on evidence-based decision-making. So I think it would be really helpful if the staff could report back, um, you know, if we're talking about this next week or what week before we vote, I guess I would say, uh, if the staff could report back on the pros and cons of imposing total compensation caps for a subset of employees in this ACO guidance, but potentially in future regulatory processes as well. So I guess specifically I'm looking for a staff analysis of the pros and cons of using executive compensation as a regulatory tool and also a staff recommendation based on that analysis on whether you think this regulatory approach should be pursued in this ACO guidance. Um, and I think just as a board, I think we should make sure that the benefits that we hope to see by imposing compensation caps outweigh any potential costs or downside uh, implications. Um, I also, and I think Michelle, to the degree you did answer this to some degree, but it would be really helpful since you're digging into this before next week anyway, I think I'd, I'd like to better understand the specific benchmark chosen by the ACO. Um, is the compensation compared to all healthcare executives in the US? Is it executives at similarly sized ACOs? 
you know, who are the peer organizations that a national benchmark is, you mentioned it might be regionally adjusted. That would be helpful to know. I think if we're going to impose uh, caps on salaries or, or tying it to a particular benchmark, I think we should understand what that benchmark actually is. So those are just my requests before we um, head into a vote on this. I think just a deeper understanding of intended and unintended consequences of going into a new lane here, so to speak, for uh, regulatory action. Any other board member question or comment? Um, I had one, uh, Michelle. Um, I might talk to you about it offline because I want to do some drafting. Um, so I'll wait and get back to you and maybe raise it next week. Um, any uh, healthcare advocate comment or question? Thanks, Chair Foster. Um, thanks to Michelle, Russ, and Jen and, and others for the great work on this. I think there are a lot of really important updates and edits to the guidance. Um, we just had, we largely support it. Just a couple of recommendations for the board to consider. I know we're not voting today. Um, the first one, we would encourage the board to consider revising section six to include directors in addition to VPs and above as the category. There are a number of executives that have that title rather than just VP and above. And I think the intent of this approach, if the board decides to adopt it, would be better served um, if we include those categories as well. Um, and similar to member Holmes's comment, I think it would be good for the board to consider what peer group to use the benchmark with. I don't, similarly, I don't really know what the benchmark is currently used. It seems like there's a couple different ones. And I think that the board would be better served to identify one themselves. Um, and on section seven, we would recommend setting the target to be 100% of variable compensation connected to performance measures that are specific and measurable. We think this aligns with the intent of the rule much better. And we have concerns that the board would be unintentionally lowering that standard by having a percentage that's lower than 100. Um, so those are our comments. Thanks a lot and appreciate the discussion. Thank you. And so, Ms. Sawyer, we don't actually have the benchmarking data that's being discussed, and we don't actually have where the numbers lie in relation to the benchmark data. We don't currently possess that. Is that right? Correct. We are not in possession of a um, an analysis of really position by position and where each position is is benchmarked currently um, in the percentile. Um, we may have some additional information about the peer group. I have to do a little digging on that, and I will get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, it seems like a fair question. I mean, we might as well understand it. I think it's a good point. So if we can put in an ask for that, I think it's logical. Um, and I'll turn it to public comment. Um, Mr. Davis, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've just got a couple of things to say. I think that this, uh, I've watched government for 62 years as a professional from one end of the country and including the national level. What you're looking at, what you've just described there is I've never seen, I, I never, that's just a bureaucratic nightmare. There's just, it take, you, you, if, you, if they actually, if the, all these hospitals had to actually do that work, it would cost you at least $20 million and you wouldn't have any idea what to do with it. Uh, this is, and our government has been working on this for, for all that time, not, not in, in Vermont, I mean, but looking at, well, what, how does government function? How should it, how should it actually work? And a, a, an interesting test that I would recommend to you that I know you won't touch is that if you should not, they should, you should not accept any of the, the uh, tests suggested unless the board, unless the, the bureaucrats can show what they would do if they actually had that information. They, if, and to, just to get it, you can't, you, you can, you, UVM will be able to do it, but the, the other hospitals won't even begin to come close to this, okay? I mean, it just, it just can't be done. Maybe 10%, but if they would actually do it, it would cost at least 20 million extra dollars you'd add the cost. I'd like to just make a comment that I, uh, that I uh, on your indulgence, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. 
the do you, mind, do you mind if I interrupt for one minute? I started to interrupt, but I wasn't clear what um, topic you were talking about with your first comment about the challenge of being able to get something and what the hospitals would do with it. What what topic were you discussing? The 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 the, the entire the entire laundry list. What I'm talking about is the entire laundry list of, of question after question after question after question after question. It's not that each question can't be justified, but when you add them all together, there's simply there's there's just simply not enough time to do that. Then and the only pot hospital that has a chance to do it is UVM. There will it's never going to happen in places like Springfield and Rutland. I mean, really is not. Um, that's what I meant. I do have an extra comment uh, on your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Please, One of the please, things please. I've been critical here of this of, of the board a lot, but I want to say this that I I'm impressed by I think uh, that you're that one of the things that this board is now really doing is I think they're attacking the issue. I think that they're really starting to get at what it's going to really take to make this uh, make a system that is sustainable for both cost and quality. I don't think we're close to it there yet, but really trying. I, want to, I just want to comment that I think that the single most disturbing thing is that the people that really that, that, that run 60 percent of this whole system, 60 percent of it, are not part of this conversation. And that's their choice. That's UVM's, that's UVM's senior management choice. And they are not on. You cannot play in a game unless you're willing to go on the field. And whatever else the board is, this board has done, they're on the field. Okay, and whatever else is going on, UVM is not on the not on the field. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, Sharon, uh, please go ahead. I see your hands raised. Yeah, I do believe that management of any system um, in accountability must have compensation relative to the outcomes. And that's where variable pay comes in. I don't know that that has been the past, that variable pay has been on um, actual improvements, because I, I guess the improvements are, are not there or questionable. So it is a bit confusing. I would think in the guidelines that I understand the base salary would be 50% of the benchmark. And what I heard was the benchmark is what the ACO presents. So it's not like the board needs to determine what is 50%. That comes from the the ACO uh, management or whatever. And, and then I would hope that the variable pay, um, but I don't know how it can be legislated, would actually be variable. You know, and and I don't I did not hear in the guidelines if the variable pay plus the base would be at 50 percent or a variable pay would be, again, based on this peer benchmark. Um, and of course, if if everybody is basically getting paid regardless, then um, it defeats the purpose of variable pay. And then you might as well just go to base salary being 50 percent. So that's the only the guidelines, there should be some direction of variable pay um, being paid on outcome. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and Walter, how are you? Hey, Owen. Uh, hanging in there. Head throbbing from all the detail here. Um, I do agree with Ham a little bit about the executive compensation, although I think it should definitely be regulated. I also agree with the HCA on it, and I can't. Executive compensation is already outlandish, and most of the Vermonters that are paying this in the one care make 15, 20, 25 bucks an hour and <clears throat> don't have benefits don't have health care, don't have retirement pensions or anything like that because they are no longer provided. So the day-to-day -day Vermonters who are paying these salaries should see some account for what they're going to pay for, what they're paying for, if. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a great thing. And Michelle made a comment at the end of her presentation about health care reform being complicated. 
it doesn't have to be complicated. It should be inordinately simple. Every other democratic nation has figured this out. One care to me is just another layer of complications. <clears throat> That's it. Thank you very much. Any other question or comment? Uh, Mr. Berman, how are you? Please go ahead. Hi, this is Abe Berman. I'm the interim CEO of One Care Vermont. Um, I just wanted to, to um, clarify that we did submit um, a letter on June 9th, and we followed that up with a second letter today. Um, we were not able to comment earlier than that because our board did not meet until yesterday with this regularly scheduled meeting. Um, and um, further, um, in reviewing the budget guidance, and uh, you know, I'm a little bit new in the role, having only been here about three weeks now. Just, you know, noteworthy that this is a significant body of work that the ACO has to go through each year to provide this information. Um, and unfortunately, that takes away from our ability to work on some of the strategic initiatives that I think the board agrees are really important. So um, I, uh, I appreciate all the work that's gone into it, and we certainly will comply to the best of our ability. Um, but I just wanted to be clear that it is a significant body of work, and it's, it is bigger than it is in previous years this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other question or comment? Okay, great. Um, Ms. Sawyer, Mr. McCracken, thank you very much for your team's diligence and work on this. And I think one of you has a day off tomorrow, so enjoy it. Um, I think that's all we have on the agenda today. Um, so is there any uh, old business to come before the board? Or new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we are adjourned. Have a good afternoon.